All right, again, thank you for tonight. First of all, what I do want to do is we want to lift up uh, an associate of mine's brother, just had a kidney transplant. Been living on dialysis for six years. And he said something that I contemplated. He goes, yeah, he's not going to know what to do with himself. And I went, you're right. He's like that caged bear who gets freed, but he just keeps walking back. He's so used to not being able to do the things he wants to do or travel. So, you know, now you know once he's got this kidney, if it's working right, there's still going to be something in him keeping him back. If he doesn't free himself up to know, hey, I'm healed. Healed and whole. So we're going to pray for him for his healing and that he knows going forward that he's whole and he can go on out and walk this life out the way he should. So just join me. Lord, we thank you for Lenny, Lord. We thank you that this kidney transplant took place, Lord, and the surgery is done, performed, and that healing is taken, just like healing in this house. Healing is happening in his house right now, Lord. And that he's going to come through this, and his mind is going to be set forward and not stuck on the past, and know that he can walk out his physical life with no more inhibition, Lord. And that his mind will be set free from it. Thank you, God, that his body is set free from it now, and his mind... And we just give you all the honor and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So, Willie, we're going to start out in Genesis 2.15. And if time allows, we'll go all the way through the end of chapter 3. All right, here we go. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and guard and keep it. All right, 16. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may freely eat of every tree of the garden. Now keep that in mind. God told the man that. But the tree of knowledge of good and evil and blessing and calamity shall not eat. For in that day you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now let's read that again. For in that day... Now, mark that down in your memory bank for a minute. He didn't say that day, for in that day. And we'll bring that out in a minute. For in that day, you eat of it, you shall surely die. Because I don't know if y'all been asked, but I've asked, well, Adam A, why didn't he die that day? Hold on to that. We're getting there. There, Thank you, Frank. I was waiting for you. Did y'all hear Frank? What is, what is a day to, to the Lord? A thousand years is like a day. Amen. In that day. Okay? Next verse, please. All right. Now the Lord God said, It is not good, sufficient, satisfactory that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper meet, suitable, adapted, complimentary for him. Okay, here we go. Now when you read that verse, you think the next thing, well, here comes Eve. Nope. Let's go to the next verse. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every wild beast and living creature of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. Time out. God brought them to Adam? Who is this Adam fellow? What is this creation that he's so mindful of him? Gave him the authority to name every living creature on this planet. And whatever Adam called every living creature, that's what it's named. That's it. I love it. It's a great love story. Remember? What is mindful? I, I get to name the creature. And you don't think you're loved? Let's go to the next verse. And Adam gave names to all the livestock. Oh, I'm sorry, Willie, go on to the next one. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs or part of his side and closed up the flesh. Next. And the rib, part of his side, which the Lord God had taken from the man, he built up and made into a woman. And he brought her to the man. Here we go. You talked about this the other day. Go ahead, Willie. Then Adam said, this creature... Is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. So who named a woman? 
Adam. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Now go back a couple verses, Willie. Let's go back to um, 20 again. Yeah, I think I, I might have skipped that. But 220. So again, and Adam gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the air and to every wild beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper meat, suitable, adapted, complimentary for him. So God said, look, it's not good for man to be alone. So most people think the next part of the story is, well, he gave him woman. No, he didn't. God did this. Hey, here's this animal, here's this animal. Adam names him. Greatest love story. Did I tell you that? It's the greatest love story ever. Because he was so mindful of Adam that Adam's like, you know, Lord, he's a cow, but just, it's just not what I need. It's not what I desire. He will give us what? Bingo. So Adam wasn't happy. He was like, eh. So then go on again. So that's when he took the rib and he made a woman for Adam, a female companion. And Adam gave her the name of woman. So go on to 22 there. Let's see. Nope, uh, going down to 24. We'll skip down to 24. So Adam named her woman. And this was what Pastor Bob was teaching on Sunday. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall become united and cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Now, that's a verse that a lot of people in today's world don't want to comprehend, don't comprehend, don't really believe. They get married saying the vows with no meaning behind it. So, that says, wait a minute, become one flesh. Now listen, we're not foolish. You know we're still one body here and one body here, but God says when I put you together under my ordinance, you are one. 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 You are one. So, and the man, 25, yep, and the man and his wife were both naked and were not embarrassed or ashamed in each other's presence. Why? Why? They were one. And what else? They were living in perfect peace and harmony at that point, remember? The problem hadn't come yet. So it was perfect harmony, perfect peace, perfect communion. Everything was smooth. Wasn't no shaking yet, but the shaking was coming. So God's design, here's man, and I I love what I created so much, I'm going to get him full authority. And whatever he names, everything I create, that's what it's going to be called. If that ain't a love story, I don't know what is. I mean, how many of us do that? Mm-mm, we don't do that. Now listen, Jacob, whatever you... No, wait, uh, you got some time to brew first before I let you say something like that. But see, God loved his creation so much and put it into place and said, listen, this is my creation, and I'm giving him full authority, and that's the way it is, and they're going to be in perfect harmony. And I love him so much, I want him to have a companion. And I made some things I thought might be a companion. But it didn't fulfill his need. See, God is mindful of us. He didn't remember. It didn't, the scripture didn't say he made the woman right after he said, I'll give him a, a helpmate. And see, that gets skipped over. But that's part of the love story. That's why it's so important to know that verse in between those two. You can actually say to God, God, I know you've given me these things, but it's just not what I need. And he listens. That's awesome. Thank God he listened. <laughs> Man, you can give me a thumbs up on that one. <laughs> All right. 
So that's 25. So now let's go on down to chapter 3. So again, remember these couple things. For in that day, for in that day we will surely die. The commandment was given to Adam about not eating, right? Before the woman was even created. Before the rib was even, the woman wasn't there. Adam was told. Adam was told. And he loved his creation so much, he gave creed to Adam's desire. Lord, I know you've gave me these things, and I've named it, but I'm just, it just didn't, whew, it's not what I need. It's not what I want. Oh, okay, we'll fix that. Put you in a sleep, and we'll make something happen. Again, it's the greatest love story. Who would ever think a love story is in Genesis? That's where it all begins. I love it. So now chapter 3. So now the serpent was more subtle and crafty than any living creature of the field which the Lord God had made. And he, Satan, said to the woman, Can it really be that God has said, You shall not eat from every tree of the garden? Hmm. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. And then she says, Except the fruit from the tree which is in the middle of the garden. God has said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Now, what is Eve doing there? Remember, God didn't tell Eve that. God told Adam. So Adam must have said, listen now, honey. This is all ours. I've named everything. We get to enjoy all this as perfect peace. But there's one thing we cannot do. Again, it doesn't say, oh, listen, after he made Eve, God said to Eve, now listen, Eve, he didn't give her the commandment. you got to know where you, which lane you're in, okay? Whose responsibility is it given to? Bingo. So you got to know in your own life, who's responsible for this decision? Who's, whose burden is it to make this decision? The blame game don't work, especially when it wasn't even the person's right to make the call. Okay? So there we go. We got... So again, God has said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. So again, she's repeating what Adam had to tell her. Next verse. But then the serpent said to the woman... You surely, you shall not surely die. There's that dart. Come on, you're not going to die. That's absurd. I mean, I can just hear the devil talking today. Don't be a fool. Now, guess what we do as humans when someone talks to us that way? Yeah, I'm no fool. I'm not stupid. I'm yeah, I'm not going to die if I... See, that's how it works. Put it in today's verbiage. You, you, you put it on Facebook. Hey, hey, you idiot. You're not going to die if you do that. Oh, yeah, 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 I know, I know. See, that's how su- subtle. Throw that little thing out there. But you got to learn how to do this. you got to learn to speak to the fiery darts. Okay? you got to learn how to speak to them fiery darts because they're coming. You know, they're coming. I'll give you an example. I'm married to Rachel. Hey, Mom, Dad. I love Rachel. He was there. He knows I love Rachel. We had a meltdown at that wedding. We loved it. Now, I have never, sitting around my house, looked around and, or told my friends, yeah, I'll never cheat on my wife. It sounds crazy, don't it? But you know what I do say? Listen, I'm not a fool. Let me tell you what I won't do, though. I won't go out hanging out at clubs where I shouldn't be. I won't let my friends try to talk me into hanging out with their friends where I shouldn't be at. I won't won't do... See, I know that if I go out there and say, oh, I would never do that, I know how many darts are coming. And sometimes you can only take so many darts... So I speak to the darts. Well, guys, y'all have a good time. I'll be home. 
with my family. Yeah, yeah, but don't you get to do what you want? Yeah, sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. So you got to speak to the, to the fiery darts. Because I'm going to tell you something. I've seen a lot of people who do the I'll never, and about 99% of them do it. You go back in your own life and recollect the I nevers. That is a trap. Now in my heart, my heart is saying, yeah, I'll never do that. But I know I'm a man just like the bit the apple. Who had it more perfect than Adam? He had it so, it was so blissful. In all that bliss, he still messed up. So don't be so foolish to say, I'll never, because the fiery darts are coming. But what you can do is say, I'm going to do the things I should do, so I don't do the things I shouldn't do. All right? I won't cheat on Rachel. Because I do those things. <laughs> you got to use you as the example, remember. Now, say, now I know standing right here. Don't you know there's some darts going to come my way? Probably tomorrow. That good looking girl is going to come flying by, Pastor Bob. I know it already. But I'll do what my dad said one time. You know what happens when that happens? I just go to the other side of the street. If you avoid the interference or put it in its place, it won't influence your life. Remember what I said, all right? What do we got? Chapter three, okay, three and four. Okay, so number five. So again, listen, Eve, you ain't going to die. Go on and eat the fruit. So for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. So there's that subtle little de uh, devil talking to her. And you will be like God, knowing the difference between good and evil and blessing and calamity. Well, wow, that sounds pretty good. If I don't die and I gain all that, man, I probably should go ahead and do that thing. All of a sudden, Satan's interference is becoming the influence in her life. And she's going to make a decision based off of the influence now. It's easy to recognize the interference, but when the interference subtly becomes the influence, you don't recognize that anymore. You just act it out. Think about it in your own personal life. It's, I'm tr it's happened, I know. It's happened here. So here we go. Number six. And when the woman saw that the tree was good, suitable, and pleasant for food and that it was delightful to look at, and a tree to be desired in order to make one wise. I mean, that sounds pretty good to me. I'd probably want some of that fruit. She took of its fruit and ate. And here's the next sentence. And she gave some also to her husband, and he ate. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. So... It's all good. I got this garden. I've named every creature. I got this wife pulled right out of my own rib. I mean, this is great. It's so peaceful here. And look at my wife. I mean, if she gives me an apple or fruit, I'm going to eat. Well, I thought God told him, don't do that. Hmm. Eve let interference become an influence, and that influence jumped right on over there to Adam. The trickle effect. Why do you think there's generational curses? Rewind the tape and go back and find that root of that problem. So again, so now we got... She also gave to her husband, and he ate. There's a whole story right there. <laughs> there's not many words in the scripture about it, but there's a whoo, there's a lot there. So how it went down, we don't really know. 
But, I mean, again, I can see it. Well, Adam, come on, man. You're not going to die. I'm Eve. I'm your wife. I'm so-and-so in your life. Shouldn't you listen to me? I'm the interference right now, but you don't recognize it. I'm duping you, and I don't even know it now, because, see, I let interference get in my life where it became an influence, and I don't even recognize that it's an interference anymore. So why do you think your eyes are glazed over? You got to stomp the interferences out. You got to be tough on interferences in your life, especially where they involve interfering with you and God's desire for your life. You will never see the full glory of God in your life walking around on this planet if you just constantly let people interfere. Circumstances interfere. People's beliefs and opinions interfere. You cannot let those things interfere. Because again, it's just, like, it's just like alcohol. If a bottle of alcohol is sitting right there, it's just a bottle of alcohol sitting right there. Now, if you take it, and you drink it, and you like it, and you put it up, all right, there you go. But then if you think, you know, that did something for me. I like that. And you keep on. And all of a sudden, you're drinking every day, all day long. Because you let the way that thing, which has no, it can't do anything to you, other than if you let it. But you're all of a sudden let that thing interfere, and that interference has become the influence of your life. And now you're walking around in a stupor. Now let's go back. You, got, you kicked the alcohol, you've been clean for a year and a half. And here comes your friend Mike. Mike plops down on the couch, wants to talk to you. Well, you know what? I'm going to grab me a beer. I'm going to grab me two. And that's fine. That's, it's, it's lawful for him to do. But not in that setting, it's not good for him to do. Because guess what he's doing now? He's interfering in this man's recovery. He's not helping him, he's interfering. And this immature Christian isn't strong enough to fight that. Well, if he's, I mean, I'll, okay, I'll be all right, one or two. Boom, there goes the story again. And we know it, we've seen it. Alcohol is just a good example because most people deal with it. But it's all kind of aspects in our lives. All kind of aspects. So here we go. It's three, uh, so just to recap, she gave the fruit to her husband and he ate. Then the eyes of them both were open. Now, let's stop there. Eve's eyes weren't open when she ate it. It was only after Adam ate. Remember that. See, now that doesn't get told. Who got the commandment? Adam. Eve ate the apple. It doesn't say when she ate it, her eyes were open. It said, after Adam ate, then their eyes were open. Bingo. I can just, if you just go back and say, boy, if, if Adam didn't bite and take the bait, all that could have been avoided. But after he did, then, then the eyes were open. So then the eyes of them both were open. And they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves apron-like girdles. Number eight. And they heard the sound of the Lord. Oh, oh. Now this, now listen now. And then they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord, God, among the trees of the garden. Now, what a flip. 
What a flip. A day earlier, they heard the Lord, let's go get the Lord. Let's go get him. The next day, hiding all over the place from him. They changed the dynamic. Disobedience has a consequence. And they recognized something was different. Something ain't right. Because normally if you hear the Lord God walking, you want to go find out where he is. Let's go get him. Let's see him. But this time they hid. Mm, that's not good. Number nine. But then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, where are you? <laughs> he said, I heard the sound of you walking in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. See, Lord God, what happened? See, I, I did something I wasn't supposed to, and now I kind of feel a little ashamed and embarrassed, and I, sh I don't even think I should be in your presence. Isn't that how we all get? We get ashamed. We feel dirty. We hiding from God. Hiding from the creator of the universe. How are you going to hide from the creator of the universe? You can't. May as well go ahead and get that through our thick skulls. We can't hide. Ain't no need to try. And then God said, who told you that you were naked? And before an answer even came, have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Uh. Remember, it was perfect harmony. What, I think God, what could be wrong with that boy? I mean, there's just, everything's going good. There's one thing I told him not to do. That must be the problem. That must be the problem. We as parents should recognize that kind of thing with our children. Up, oh, up, oh, he's acting different. She's acting different. She must have disobeyed on that rule I gave her. Gave him. That, what does it say again? Who told you you were naked and before an answer came, have you eaten of that tree which I told you not to, boy? Because see, you're acting a little funny. you a little shaky today. I mean, you got fig leaves all over you hiding from me. Uh-uh. <laughs> So what Adam do? Well, that woman you gave me, Lord. I mean, it's your problem, your fault. You know, the person is always helping you, to, trying to help you the most. You know, that's the one you blame first. Been there. So the woman you gave me, huh? She gave me the fruit from the tree. So what you expect me to do? I hate it. I mean, you gave her to me. I must have been a tough one. You got to be real messed up when you blame God. You got to be something. Be something's got to be dysfunctioning up there. I mean, I mean, Lord, look, you gave me the garden. I got the name, everything. You gave me this woman. You got every everything's good. But you know, it's your fault. It's your fault. Hmm. Yeah. So then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled, cheated, outwitted, and deceived me, and I ate. Eve ain't no different than me and you. Okay? Ain't no different. Because that serpent came for kill, steal, and destroy. And she gave in to killing, stealing, and destroying. Because fear and awe, he's making it sound so good, it's got to be right. He lied to me. Remember, Satan's power over you is your belief in his lies. That's it. That's it. You ain't got to go to a psychiatrist, a psychologist, or no one to figure that out. His power over you is your faith in his lies. You're going to believe in God, have faith in God, or you're going to have faith in Satan. You can't be in the middle. All right? The middle means...
trust Satan over God. Because God ain't got no middle ground. I ain't never seen no middle ground. I've never seen him give you a middle ground. You're either with me or you're against me. That's powerful. That's powerful. And it's still the greatest love story. Did I tell you that one? Even in the midst of this problem, it's the greatest love story ever. So where were we at? And so I ate. So number 14, the Lord God said to the serpent, getting on his case now, because you have done this, you are cursed above all domestic animals and above every wild living creature of the field. Upon your belly shall go, you shall go, and you shall eat dust and what it contains all the days of your life. Goodness gracious. This is interesting. This was said to the serpent after he deceived Adam and Eve. This was punishment to, the, to Satan. And I always think, well, God, he didn't even do this before. He did this after as a consequence of his treachery. So then he says in number 15, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and, and her offspring. He will bruise and tread your head underfoot, and you will lie in wait and bruise his heel. And we know the story there. All right, so number 16. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your grief and suffering in pregnancy and the pangs of childbearing. With the spasms of distress, you will bring four children. Now notice this now. Yet your desire and craving will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Did you notice that there's a shift there? You're going, you're going to suffer through childbearing, and now you're going to be subject to your husband. God set the parameter there. The parameter wasn't there. He didn't state that before. He, never, he didn't say, now listen, we created Eve, and she's, they were a union. They were, but now, okay, since you lied and dealt this blow, there's going to be a punishment to everyone involved. At the same time, he punished Adam, Eve, and Satan. God's a powerful God. And he don't play favors when it comes to you disobeying his word. All right, in these same verses, he punished Satan and Adam and Eve. All for the same issue. So, your desire and craving will be for your husband and he will rule over you. So a dynamic, and we can't explain all this. Some of this stuff, we just, but something shifted there, because it states there. It didn't state it before. And to Adam in 17, he said, because you have listened and given heed to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, remember that, he told Adam, saying, you shall not eat of it, the ground is under a curse because of you, and in sorrow and toil shall you eat of the fruits of all the days of your life. <laughs> Disobedience is not good. <laughs> How would you like to get punished with you, your wife, and Satan all in the same round table real quick like? And that's what happened there. That's bad stuff. That's, dis that's the result of of disobedience. Forget, forget what you think it is. Oh, the result of disobedience is some harsh stuff. Basically, God said, you are going to pay the consequence and our perfect harmony we had previously is taking a different approach now. You, it, it ain't, we were so blissful but now there's some different order in line. And you will, you will have to walk out that order. That's why I can't wait for the glorified bodies, Pastor Bob. Woo! <laughs> and that's a good example of the differences. See, before, it didn't talk about when he created Eve. Listen now, here's Adam, and you, he'll rule over you. He didn't say it then. 
He said it after these issues and this disobedience. So he, the punishments came. There was no punishments before. Disobedience. So number 17, we read that. So then, 18, thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth for you, and you shall eat of the plants of the field. Number 19, in the sweat of your face shall you eat bread until you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and dust you shall return. Okay, Lord. Number 20, the man called his wife's name Eve, life spring, because she was the mother of all the living. 21, for Adam, also, for Adam also and for his wife, the Lord God made long coats of skins and clothed them. Y'all didn't know God was the first tailor in town, did you? I mean, God's up there with a sewing machine. getting. It. <laughs> hey, he made the universe. I think he can make some clothes if he wants to. <laughs> so number 22, and the Lord God said, behold... The man has become like one of us. Oh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. To know how to distinguish between good and evil and blessing and calamity. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. And then, therefore, the Lord God sent him from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. Woo! Number 24, so God drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the garden the cherubim and flaming sword, which turned every way to keep and guard the way to the tree of life. God then had to guard, because he knew, he knew. Listen, they're going to be disobedient. (laughs) So now I'll put a guard out there so that I don't happen again. But it's the greatest love story still. In that day you shall surely die. Well, let's see. Satan's up there thinking, well, you know, God said that they would die and they're still alive. But it said in that day, and a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. So how Adam was 930 years old, I believe. So that's still in a thousand years, and if a thousand years is like a day, and a day is like a thousand years, I think God proved his point. That's a whole nother study, isn't it, Pastor Bob? But in that day, you shall surely die. Because remember, they messed up the order, and death came in. It, it wasn't, it wasn't, I never read anywhere before all that that, Hey, listen, y'all going to live for a little bit and then die. It was after the fall, the disobedience. And I don't even like to say the fall. It was the disobedience. It was the, dis- it was the I allowed you to interfere with my, now this is going to be harsh, with my faith, with my belief. I allowed you to interfere with what I know is absolutely 100% true. But see, but it sounded so nice in the time, I just closed it up and put it on the shelf, and I started listening to how rosy it was. Hmm. See, it's not always just money. It's not fa- It's all kind of subtleties. Just the, the emotional part is enough for us. Well, that makes me feel good. I like the way that sounds. It wasn't no big, crazy, climatic thing. Don't eat that fruit. You ate the fruit. You're blaming me, because I made the fruit. I love you so much, I made the fruit. I love you so much, I gave you everything else. I gave you all power and all authority, everything. I gave you the desires of your heart. Can you, listen, I threw these things at you that didn't please you. I gave you what pleased you. 
and you disobeyed me and blamed me. But I still love you so much about provisions. God must have this sack that's full of provisions. I mean, it must, I mean, you think Santa Claus sack, you ought to see God's sack. He's pulling around with provisions. He's got some provisions, man. Warehouse full of provisions. Whenever you doubt how much God loves you, just think about Adam. Just think about Adam. God, you love us so much. You give us so much authority and so much relation and so much. You give us our desires of our heart as long as we're walking in your love. And I know, God, if I disobey, you're going to deal with me. But I also know that at the same time, you dealing with me, you hugging on me and loving on me. It's a powerful love story. And it started right there in Genesis. And there's so many little nuggets. And I don't know if you've heard some of that, but there's just like the skip. They skip the animal part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. wait a minute. God, these ain't pleasing. I need something else. And God did it. That's a powerful part of the story. God, you gave me everything, but that just didn't it. I just need this thing, God. And he gave it to him. Gave it to him. Don't let the interference become your influence. And I want to do several different teachings about that in different aspects of your life. This was just one aspect from the beginning, how it started. Where Adam let the love for his wife, which is not bad, but it's bad when you let it overrule what God tells you. And that was the trip. It wasn't no great, it's, again, it wasn't it just, it was like a smooth ocean. You didn't know under the, the undercurrent. And it just slid right on by, right on by. Happens to all of us. I'm in that boat. You just want to recognize those interferences, know how to call them out. And listen, I know it's tough because 95% of the times it's from the family because that's who you're closest to. And with the internet today, it's all over the place. The interferences, the interferences. I'll give you one last example and, and then I'll close out. We had some friends in Charlotte, and I might have said this before, and the girl was going nuts, going, I can't take this no more. To... And this guy, Ken, has got to be one of the top five nicest guys I've ever known in my life. This guy, this great guy to be married to, Pastor Bob. And she, ah, da, 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 da. I said, boy, I tell you what, she sure is telling everybody about everything on the Facebook, isn't she? She's letting everyone know how bad her husband is. So I told Rachel, because I don't counsel the women, I let the woman counsel the woman, do it God's way. I said, call her, tell her, get off of Facebook, and her marriage will be repaired within a week. Rachel called her, said, Charles said... <laughs> Because Rachel knew the battle was coming. Charles said, and they know me. If I say something like that, that meaningful, they know I mean it. So she got off the Facebook. She gets Rachel back on the phone within less than a week. Rachel, I don't know what's happened. Just something has happened. And I said, I, I could hear them talking. I finally said, did she get off the Facebook? You know, I knew she did. I could tell by the conversation. Yes, yeah, she said she's off of that. I then said, well, now encourage her to stay off of it. There was the interference. Her avenue of bad-mouthing and telling her story about how bad her husband is, who was one of the greatest guys I've ever known in my life, became her influence. And out of that, she thought her marriage was bad. 
Her marriage was fine. Her marriage was fine. Her attitude got influenced. Because she let that little easy avenue of displeasure, that easy way to spout off that interference with her daily life with her husband, she let that become the influence in her life and made her think she had a marriage problem. Let me tell you something. If you really got a marriage problem, it's not going to usually repair in a week. So that tells you the story right there. It was not a marriage problem. It was a me problem. I need to shut me mouth. I need to quit telling on my husband. (laughs) I need to praise him. If I'm going to speak of him, I need to praise him and not demean him. Let that be a word to everyone here. Do not demean publicly your spouse. That's a no, no. Yeah, you praise them. You deal with that stuff in your own personal space. And that's what was happening there. And that thing became a problem with her. And I'm just grateful that God gave me discernment to... To tell her that. And, and, to be, and to mean it. And to, okay, well, if you're going to do it, you're going to be accountable too. See, that's one of the problems. People don't want to be accountable to something. But interference, if you don't kick it out the door, well, it is a bad fungus. <laughs> and it will influence your every decision in your life from then on. So be guardful. Watch that stuff. So that was a little synopsis there of of how that started out right there with Adam, Eve, and Satan. I let that guy interfere with my commandment that was given to me. I let that thing interfere with what my husband told me. But it sounded so good, I just let it interfere. But it sounded good. This sounds good. And it is good. And if you ever think something sounds good, just check it against this. And you'll see if it's good or not. Real quick, like, it don't take days, it takes about five minutes. All right, thank you.